Our next speaker is John R. Bowen, the Dunbar Van Cleve Professor in Arts and Sciences and Professor of Sociocultural Anthropology in Arts and Sciences. Professor Bowen will present on how Muslims adapt to new worlds. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bowen. Thank you, Lee. I'm happy to be here. I'm an anthropologist. We're a diverse bunch, biologists, archaeologists, and I'm a social anthropologist, which means I, I study living peoples throughout the world. We have a common idea that humans adapt, that as people move to new places or the world changes around them, they modify their ideas and practices, including religious ideas. It works. For my part, I study how Muslims living in Asia, Europe, or the United States do this, and I want to illustrate how this works by looking into adaptations regarding family, gender, and food. Why is it important to study how Muslims or others adapt? I find that doing so gives us ways to counter some of the most pernicious lies told about other people, lies based precisely on the false idea that some people do not adapt, that Muslims, Jews, African Americans, and in the past, Irish, Italians and Catholics generally have fixed immutable characteristics with their distinct races. Today, some also say that we are in a race with them, that various thems will invade some version of us or outreproduce us. A catchphrase born in France is the great replacement. You may have seen or heard the cries of Jews will not replace us, shouted by white supremacists marching in Charlottesville. blood barrier being penetrated. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> it was non-invasive. Thank you very much for that technique. <laughs> so back to a negative moment, unfortunately, a couple years ago, a bit more than that, when people were marching in Charlottesville yelling out, Jews will not replace us. The great replacement meme that surfaced there is so attractive because it allows you to switch in whatever group you think is scariest to your target audience. Muslims in Europe, Jews in for the Virginia marchers, or for some, immigrants entering the US. Phony math is involved, as with the viral Muslim demographics video on YouTube that informs viewers that France has 1.8 children per family, but that French Muslims have 8.1 children per family. A bit too neat, don't you think? Because Muslims are commanded to do so by the religion and that by 2050, France will be an Islamic Republic, majority Muslim. Now, aside from the fact that France does not even collect demographic data by religion, these claims don't square with reality. For France, the best estimates, which are usually from the Pew Foundation, the best estimate is that by 2050, the Muslim population will have grown from about 9% of the population to about 11.5% most of that increase from immigration. But let's take a broader look at changes in family size for people of different religions across the world. We look at the number of children per woman, or total fertility rate, worldwide. These rates are falling for Muslims, for Christians, and across the board. Muslims' new reflections on Islam play a role in these drops. Let's turn to Indonesia, where I've worked for many years. Here's a graph of population drops in majority Muslim nations across the world. Indonesia is the bottom blue curve, and you can see the sharp drop there between 1970 and 2000. As it happens, I was studying local Islamic life in Indonesia during this period when family size made its historic drop. The replacement theorists would say that such a drop is impossible because Islam commands its followers to have large families. Indeed, a commonly said prayer expresses the wish May God bless you with many pious children. So I paid attention to what local Islamic leaders were saying about having many pious children in such places such as this mosque in Sulawesi, where I was working. At the beginning of this period, it was clearly understood as urging families to have many children, a practice that once made sense for rural communities where children died young and children would make net contributions to the family income starting at an early age. But by the end of my research there, Islamic scholars in, in their Friday sermons had introduced another view of that prayer. 
Families were now told that raising a pious child, a pious child meant a substantial commitment for schooling and training, the sort of thing Fred talked about, especially in an increasingly urban milieu. Now the emphasis was on the second adjective, raising many pious children, a goal best achieved in a smaller family. So people adapt, and they do so by way of rethinking, not abandoning their traditions. My second example comes from the domain of gender, and specifically Muslim women's rights to property. Now these rights were there at the beginning. After all, Muhammad managed his wife's caravan. Inheritance rules and practices set out in the scriptures awarded property to daughters as well as to sons, although not in equal shares. For a very long time, men have often been able to keep women from enjoying those rights. But women's expanded roles in societies have led Islamic courts to pay greater attention to women's rights. Recently, the Princeton anthropologist Lawrence Rosen analyzed worldwide data and found that women win cases decided in Muslim family courts between 65 and 95 percent of the time. Back to Indonesia. Back to Indonesia, he said longingly. There we go. Where I looked into this question with an Indonesian team, we found that judges on Islamic courts, such as this one, base their decisions today on scripture, but also, and this is the key point, they choose those passages which are most likely to support an equal division of property between women and men. These judges then have adapted to social change by marshalling, marshalling Islamic textual resources to strengthen women's rights. My last domain is food, where Muslim scholars and business people are adapting to new global patterns of trade and new food anxieties. Islam requires avoiding certain foods, such as pork products, and preventing contamination. But in an age of fast shifting global markets and fast migrating people, it's a whole lot harder to know where your food came from and what happened to it along the way. Consider, consider a family of halal foods produced by Kraft. How can you tease apart all the ingredients that go into making all these products to know what you're eating? Well, you can throw up your hands and trust to God, but what many Muslims have done have organized a massive network of commodity chains, inspection agencies, bioscientists, and religious scholars racing full speed to keep up with market evolutions. And how do you bring confidence to consumers and suppliers that they should believe you? Here's one response to that challenge. Nadim, Nadim Adam in Britain, who runs the Halal Monitoring Committee, a nationwide network of halal certifiers and Muslim businessmen who draw on a shared South Asian ancestry to build trust among producers and consumers. Indeed, often they contract business in the South Asian languages of Urdu and Gujarati, as well as English. Over the past three years, working with graduate students here and throughout the world, we've been trying to understand these developments. Doing so takes us not only to parts foreign, but also to a Muslim-run shop in Baldwin, Missouri, near here. There, I was told that they get their meat from heaven, which turns out to be the small town of New Haven near Herman. There, American halal meats with a full-time USDA inspector assisting the owner also furnishes our university food services with its halal meats for our Muslim students. And things continue to evolve. Some Muslim entrepreneurs have succeeded in making their foods organic as well as halal. Others engage with the complex realities of GMOs, and still others are working with animal rights activists to reduce animal suffering. We all adapt to new circumstances, and often by taking a new look at the texts and traditions that give our lives meaning. Following out the particularities of these adaptations and these rethinkings leads many of us to poach in diverse fields, from biology to business, to law and demography, demography to religion and anthropology. And this is something we can only do in a university. Thank you.